So a few months ago, I did a video on the crisis in cosmology, also known as the Hubble tension, this, this inconsistency that we get when we're trying to measure the present day expansion rate of the universe with different kinds of cosmological probes. And I framed it as a, a disagreement between observations of the cosmic microwave background and observations of supernova. And you know what? The story doesn't stop there. So I wanted to come back to the topic and I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this crisis so that you have more context, so, so that you better understand it. So, so this is the, is there really a crisis in cosmology? Reloaded, because we are going back into it. And we're gonna start off with the model that we are using to understand the universe. Now. Every field of science uses models. So, so when you hear the word model when applied to cosmology and the history of the universe, this is exactly just, it's just how science is done. And so there's nothing weird or funky going on here with our model. And the model has a horrible name, but we can't get away from it. It's called Lambda CDM, Lambda CDM. Lambda here, well, before I dig into the acronym, uh, the, the model, like any model in science, make some assumptions. So what we are trying to do is to describe the contents of the universe and the evolution and the history of the universe, okay? You have no small feat, right? Here's what we're uh, going to assume. And any model in any field of science always makes assumptions. And yes, you always test your assumptions. That's part of science. We don't just take these things for granted. The assumptions that go into the Lambda CDM model are very well tested, which is why they're sticking around. We are going to assume that general relativity is correct and applicable to the whole entire universe. That could be wrong, but so far it looks like it is correct. We are going to assume that the universe is flat. Again, it could be wrong, but all observations suggest that it is flat, and so we're just gonna take it as a base underlying assumption. Remember, we're trying to make a model with as few assumptions as possible and also as few free parameters as possible. We, we want the smallest set of statements that it takes in order to describe you know, what we're trying to model, in this case, the whole entire universe. So. We're gonna assume general relativity is correct. We're gonna assume the universe is flat. We're gonna assume that the universe is isotropic and homogenous. It's pretty much the same at large scales, no matter where you look and no matter where you go. And we're gonna assume that there are some ingredients. We're gonna assume that there's an ingredient called lambda, which is the symbol that cosmologists use to represent dark energy. Whatever the heck dark energy is, we don't know. We're gonna assume it's a constant. Uh, maybe we can uh, assume that it changes with time, but for now it's just a constant. It has constant density. That's dark energy, whatever the heck that is. And also we're gonna assume that there's another ingredient called cold dark matter. That's the CDM in lambda CDM. Cold dark matter just means there's a component of the universe that does not interact with light. That's what makes it dark. And that um, a long time ago, it, it was very, very slow. That's the cold part. That's the simplest way I could put it. So that's it. Those are our assumptions. Once we put those in, there are six three parameters in this Lambda CDM model. There are six parameters that we need to go out and fit to observations that we need to discover through observations. Uh, these uh, six parameters are uh, like the amount of dark matter, the amount of normal matter, uh, the age of the universe, there's a, there's a few more. So the name of the game in Lambda CDM cosmology is to go out into the universe, make some observations, find the values of those three parameters, those six ones. Once you have that, you know everything else in principle there is to know about the universe. And that's pretty awesome, right? One of the best parts about cosmology is that there are multiple probes available to us. There are multiple observational tools available to us to go out into the universe and, and to try to acquire and understand those free parameters in the Lambda CDM model. And also a lot of probes to test the Lambda CDM model. One of the most frustrating aspects about cosmology is that we have multiple probes to try to get those parameters and to test the Lambda CDM model. 
The good thing about multiple probes is that you can get cross checks and you can have multiple probes going after the same number. You can, you can get, uh, so if like you have two separate things with completely different principles, two separate observations, they both agree on the same number, that's a yay. But the downside with the multiple probes is that we don't have one probe that really fills in the whole thing. Uh, that fills in through all of cosmic time and at all cosmic scales and just gives us one giant picture of the universe. We don't have that. So we can only take it piecemeal. We need multiple probes to work together to make this thing work. And what are the probes? Well, uh, there's two general classes of cosmological probes. There is the local stuff and the global stuff. There's, there's observations you can make nearby in our local universe, and then observations you can make at the grandest of scales of very, very far away. This also separates, because of the way you know time delays work, a local measurement is going to be a measurement, not just local in space, but local in time. It's going to be relatively in the modern universe or recent epochs. And then when you go out to global scales, and you make really deep observations. You're looking way back in time. You're looking at the early universe. So some of the early universe probes you might have would be the cosmic microwave background, this leftover light from when the universe was just 380,000 years old. This is a, it soaks up the sky. It's the single largest source of photons in the entire universe. Uh, you, it's all in the microwave. So you build your microwave antennae, you put it in space, you take some microwave pictures, boom. You get your CMB and you learn a lot about the universe. You learn a lot about this Lambda CDM model. You learn about dark matter. You learn about the age of the universe. You, look, you learn about its, its flatness and et cetera. You just, you just learn a lot. Another early universe probe is Big Bang nucleosynthesis. You have uh, the formation of the light elements in our universe, hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium, but again, we don't care about lithium. And all that happens in like the first dozen minutes or so of the history of the universe, uh, and it makes like all the hydrogen. So there you go, there's all your hydrogen, and so you can compare that to observations of how much hydrogen we actually got, and you can learn about some of these fundamental physics. Another thing is called baryon acoustic oscillations. This is so cool. In the early universe, uh, our universe was very dense and very hot. It was a plasma. There were literal sound waves crashing around. And then when the cosmic microwave background was released, the, the universe transitioned from being a plasma to, to a neutral gas. This froze in some sound waves. So some sound waves were like crashing around and then all of a sudden the party stopped. And there were some regions where like the sound waves were cresting. I should do a whole video on this because it's so cool. Uh, where it were a little bit higher density than average. And then fast forward 10 billion years and what you're gonna find in those same regions, they're gonna find slightly more galaxies in those regions compared to anywhere else. This gives you a very good handle of the physics of of the universe. It gives you a very good distance sail because you know how big those sound waves were at the cosmic microwave background. You can compare how to how big they are. Uh, 10 billion years later, you get a very nice ruler there that you can use to make your cosmological measurements. Those are three of the main uh, large-scale early universe stuff. You also have a bunch of small-scale late universe, modern-day universe stuff. You have things like type 1a supernova. You have things like Mira variables. You have uh, Tully-Fisher relations of galaxies. You have tip of the red giant branches. Basically anything that you can use in the local universe where you can uh, know or figure out its absolute brightness. Because once you know an object's true absolute brightness and you can compare that to how bright it actually looks, you can get a distance to that object and then you get a recession speed and you can build up a like a local expansion rate for the universe this this Hubble constant that we call it and and so there's a bunch of different problems like the type 1a supernova or the mirror variables or Tully Fisher relations of galaxies anytime you can pin down the absolute brightness of an object you can use it to do cosmology and so the crisis in cosmology appeared originally back in 2014 when the Planck satellite released its measurements of the cosmic microwave background. And at first it was a tension between the CMB measurements and the supernova measurements because you take the CMB, 
with some extra additional information. You can plug it into the Lambda CDM model and you know everything there is to know about the universe including the present day expansion rate. You can predict what the present day expansion rate is once you know the Lambda CDM model and you fill in all those free parameters. But then we go out with Supernova and actually measure the Hubble constant and we got a different number. So Planck was giving something around 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec and the Supernova results were like 10% higher. They're around 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That's not a lot. That's only like 10% difference, but the uncertainty on those measurements are only around 2%, and so that is statistically significantly different. And that is the problem. Since then, since then, the problem has gotten worse. And it turns out that essentially almost every measure we have in the local universe of the Hubble constant, supernova, mirror variables, Tully-Fisher relations, whatever, 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 leans towards the 74, the higher number for the Hubble constant. And then whatever measurement you take of the early universe, what, and whatever combination of measurements you need to fill in the Lambda CDM model, CMB alone, uh, CMB with Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, take the CMB out and you just do Big Bang with uh, BAO, the baryon acoustic oscillation, you know, you, whatever you do in the early universe leads to this 68, the lower number. So no matter what, you can't get away from the tension. There is, when you try to measure the Hubble constant locally, however you do it, you can pretend that supernovas don't exist and you still get a higher number. And then whatever you do in the early universe with these global measurements, you get a lower number. The one exception is this method called tip of the red giant branch using a certain kind of red giant stars. That actually gives a value right smack in between the supernova and the Hubble. No one knows what to do with that. I mean, no one knows what to do with the crisis itself. Uh, but, but this is why it's a crisis because it doesn't seem to go away. There is no satisfactory answer. And it's not just a problem of supernova. It's not just a problem of CMB. It really is this great divide, this tension between early universe stuff and late universe stuff, uh, global measurements and local measurements, using things like uh, standard rulers in the CMB and the, and the BAO versus standard candles in terms of supernova and mirror variables. So it's it's a big mess. It's a big mess and there are a lot of solutions. In the past like six years, ever since this crisis first emerged, there have been over 300 published proposed solutions, 300 potential solutions to the crisis. Nobody can agree. So there, there, there are general categories here for, for solutions. One is to say, maybe we don't understand something about our early universe measurements. Okay, like maybe there's something really, really weird about trying to measure, say, the cosmic microwave background and the BAO and Big Bang nucleosynthesis, but like, what? Say, because you can throw out every single piece of data you have on the CMB and the crisis still remains. So, so what's going on there? Or you can say there's something uh, we don't understand about local measurements. Maybe it's more difficult to measure the Hubble constant than we thought it was. But this has to be like a systematic thing because you can't just point to supernova and say, look, your supernova results are ridiculous because you can also get the tension when you just look at, say, mirror variables. So just pointing to measurements seems a little bit weird. Another idea is to mess with early universe physics. Say, okay, there's more stuff going on in the early universe than we thought. Like maybe there are extra neutrino flavors or, or there's a evolving, there's early form of dark energy that did something weird and then went away. It's possible, I guess, but it's really, really hard to, to change the physics of the early universe. And so you change it to like fix the CMB but then the Big Bang nucleosynthesis happens just fine, and it doesn't alter the BAO signal at all, so you know you, you tie yourself up in knots. Uh, maybe there's something happening in the late universe. Maybe you're saying, oh, maybe at the last minute, dark energy like really ramps up or it starts talking to dark matter and it starts evolving. Maybe this assumption that the lambda in lambda CDM is fixed, maybe that assumption is wrong. But again, you start messing around you can't 
find one solution that agrees with all late universe observations. So say you mess up supernova, I mean, you still got all the other things and you, and you can't fix those. Maybe there's some really out there psychophysics happening that's really interfering with light. So these standard candles aren't really so standard anymore. We, we, we don't know. We don't know. So what comes next? There is no one solution, proposed solution, that is able to solve the crisis in cosmology, solve the Hubble tension, and agree with all other observations. So when you try to fix the Hubble constant problem, the, the Hubble tension, you end up breaking other observations. And then you go chasing after those, and you say, okay, now I'll modify my theory to fix it. Then you can't fix the Hubble tension anymore. This is why cosmologists consider it a crisis. Perhaps the word crisis is a bit overblown. It's something interesting appearing in our observations that we don't fully understand. It is the most interesting thing to happen in cosmology since the discovery of dark energy in the late 1990s. Hence, a lot of interest, a lot of papers, a lot of work. My conclusions from the last video are still pretty much the same. I do think the crisis is a little overblown. I do think likely we are uh, misunderstanding something about our observations rather than fundamental physics. Remember, my mantra is if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. An interesting thing would be new physics, evolving dark energy. You know, those would all be interesting and like super cool if, if we were able to learn that but it's probably wrong because it's interesting. The most boring explanation uh, that I can find is that it's probably more difficult to measure the Hubble constant locally than we think it is. That there's probably more systematics, there's probably more uncertainties here than we're accounting for. And uh, depending on how you measure things, like there was one uh, recent paper where they took the supernova results and they just used the exact same methods, but they just picked a different collection of supernova and they were able to get a lower value of the Hubble constant. Now this doesn't solve things like the Mira variables or the Tully-Fisher relation it, or, or gravitational lensing delays that even get into those. It doesn't solve any of those. But it's an interesting point that just by playing around with the sample, you can get different values. And it really does appear to be a tension between local measurements and global measurements, between standard candles and standard rulers, between small scale and between big scale, between late universe and between early universe. There is something we are not understanding. There are more missions proposed. Uh, there's going to be the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is going to be a big survey, a galaxy survey. There are more supernova surveys uh, doing their work. What is the answer? Honestly, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what the resolution is. I think it's something mundane and has to do with how we're measuring the Hubble constant at local scales. I do not think it's new physics. It'd be really cool if it was, though. Thank you for watching. I hope I was able to add some more context to this crisis in cosmology, which is a huge topic. I could do like 10 episodes on it. So if you want me to ask and uh, please consider supporting this show at patreon.com slash P M Sutter. I really do appreciate it and I'll see you next time.